I'm Jeff Glor from CBS Saturday Morning. Welcome to The Dish. Today we tour the nation's capital for extraordinary eats and visit three notable restaurants making D.C. dig in. We'll visit a strip mall, Taqueria, started by a European-trained chef serving up tacos and tortas with an international twist. And then a tour of Capitol Hill with the owner of three connected but distinct restaurants, each with their unique options. But first, we sit down with an author and Michelin star restaurateur passing on her favorite Middle Eastern recipes. Rose Previtt has been bringing people together over her home-style Lebanese food since 2017 at her restaurant Maidan, meaning gathering place. That's where she met Nancy Chen. Before diners get a chance to taste dishes at Maidan, they feel their heat. From the center of this intimate space, as white oak logs burn up to a thousand degrees. A truly warm welcome by Rose Previtt, who named her restaurant after the Arabic word for public square or gathering place. The reason I opened restaurants was to bring people together over food and drink. And it's really just about the energy that happens when everyone's in the same space. And I felt that in these Maidans all over the world. So I want you to come to Maidan to celebrate, to mourn, sometimes to rebel. And to feast. Here, the best order lacks order. A spread of protein, dips, and herbs is enjoyed all together in the signature towel or table experience. People are so used to coursing appetizer, main, dessert. That's not how it works here. You just fill the table and you kind of mix and match everything. So that means, I guess, that there's no right way to start our feast. No, there's absolutely no right or wrong. There are no rules. That said, we begin with the ribeye, dry rubbed with caramelized Georgian fenugreek and ajika. Do not sleep on the sumac onions. Oh. These are actually delicious and we mix them with parsley and mint and they enhance every single bite. It's served alongside a Lebanese staple, mahamra, a dip made of walnuts, roasted red pepper, pomegranates and molasses. There's also yogurt based lebne mixed with lemon, garlic and dill. Flavors that prove useful for our next combination, chicken shishtawuk. Take a whole chunk or as much as you can, put it in the bread and now you want to layer. Oh. So I would do even Muhammad Lebna or both, and I lay it right on top. And then we finally get to our sabsi platter. And then we just pull a little bit of herbs. That's good. It is good, right? My Don's colorful dishes are packed with spices, imported from markets thousands of miles away. Private shares their ingredients and stories in her book, My Don, recipes from Lebanon and beyond. You note that many of your recipes and your dishes come from parts of the world that are more associated with tragedy and trauma than food. Why is it important for you to change that narrative? I really felt it was, you know, my job almost to come back to the U.S. and teach people here about places they might not have been to. And what I found, of course, was the American perspective on the places we went was one of shock that we would go there or fear that that place might not be safe. And I was welcomed into homes of many families and women in particular who took me into their kitchens and cooked with me and taught me their family traditions. I really think that food and education are the best way to create understanding. Her approach came in part from traveling through more than two dozen countries after moving with her husband David to Moscow when he became a foreign correspondent. The three-year assignment was difficult. She had trouble finding her footing professionally. A master's graduate of public policy, Previtt was unable to obtain a work visa. I had never been one to just follow a man. And then all of a sudden I was just at parties and places just talking about David's cool job and I didn't have anything. So I felt that sense of losing myself. And that is eventually what got me to my true passion. That passion was food inspired from a young age by her Lebanese American grandmother and mother in their tiny Ohio town. My mom didn't pass along language. I don't speak Arabic. But what she did do was pass along the food so that we wouldn't forget where they came from. Why do you think food has been so resilient in being passed down across generations when other aspects of culture are not? I think that food is one of the best ways that we hold memory. And for me, and what you'll see in the cookbook, is like food is storytelling. Almost every dish in there has a story behind it. Wanting to share the culinary stories of those she's encountered, Previtt opened her first restaurant after they returned to Washington, D.C., Compass Rose, highlighting street food from around the world. 
It quickly landed on lists of D.C.'s best restaurants. And five years later, as Previtt prepared to open Maidan, she brought a team of chefs for a whirlwind research trip through the Middle East and North Africa. I call it cooking with grandmas. That was our little hashtag. In this part of the world, it tends to be women in the kitchens. And I think they hold some of the most powerful stories, the most powerful techniques. These women in these kitchens have been doing this a certain way for generations. Well, and that's really what this place is about. It was the, the passion and the spirit of women who cooked for years without any recognition. I mean, they would look at us and kind of laugh, like, why do you want to know this again? I'm just going to dash in a little bit of lemon. Previtt also incorporated recipes from her childhood just... kitchen, where her family would gather to cook and connect. So this is a recipe that's been perfected over decades. Oh, 100%. It's like a staple to everything. A creamy and smooth hummus. It's now one of Maidan's most beloved dishes. So this is a little, like a small lamb shoulder. Especially so when topped with simmered lamb. pulled lamb. Try to get a whole bite, get hummus and meat. The family recipe and technique enduring the test of time. Private holds food as a thread to her heritage and part of an inherited immigrant experience as her family assimilated with unspoken rules about what was permissible inside versus outside their home. Rules passed down like secret codes. What are those secret codes? <laughs> well, it makes me cheer up a little bit. It was what is passed down. We kind of knew, some for my parents, that there were things that maybe other people might not understand, but they wanted us to know. And I think through food and tradition, they were able to impart on us the importance of not forgetting where you came from or who you are. Not so secret anymore. Not so secret anymore. <laughs> Secrets out. <laughs> Up next, we visit Capitol Hill, where three separate restaurants are one woman's labor of love. Hollis Silverman is the juggernaut behind not one but three successful restaurants sharing a single kitchen, juggling a cocktail bar and two themed eateries. Silverman is hoping to make the restaurant industry safer for staff while creating a welcoming environment for guests. Michelle Miller visited Silverman to discuss the inspiration and challenges of running a restaurant collective. Walk into this space on Capitol Hill and no matter your taste, mood, or degree of hunger, you've got choices. There's the Italian-inspired La Colina, a cocktail bar known as the Wells, and then the Duck and the Peach, a seasonal twist on new American cuisine coined with love. So the peach is a nickname for my daughter, um, and the duck is a nickname for my old black lab, so. Give her ravioli to finish, 62. For restaurateur Hollis Wells Silverman, it's a take on the ultimate dinner party. I wanted to do something that was familiar, was a little bit nicer than maybe people could prepare at home, but not too pretentious, so really approachable. We wanted to create kind of small, intimate spaces. So but turning an old school in her neighborhood into a passion project wasn't exactly her wish come true. Restaurants are an insane business, so most of them fail. I never wanted to open a restaurant. But and you say that with a smile on your face. <laughs> I well, I feel like in the world, and especially after the pandemic, you have to have a smile on your face. With construction starting in early 2020, the first concept opened within a year. The other two followed in mid-2021. There was an opportunity to open these spaces, and I knew that if I let someone else do this, I would be not happy. Three restaurants virtually in the same spot. What, you know, how <laughs> did you pull this off? Uh, with a great team. A great team, she says, that delivers great food. Like compachi crudo with cucumber and avocado puree. Carrots over sheep's labne or yogurt. Winter squash rice made with bear beret an Ethiopian spice blend, and topped with pumpkin seeds and shallot. Mmm, smoky. Mm -hmm. It hits on the second bite. Mm -hmm. And Silverman's favorite must-have on the menu, rotisserie chicken with cilantro zoog. Roasted chicken is my love language. And why so is that? Whenever anyone needs something or you drop a meal or someone has a baby you're having a hard time, I typically roast a chicken and I give it to people. Got it. Because a roast chicken is a true sign of love and deliciousness. 
A lot of hallways in this joint. We do have a lot of hallways in this joint, leading to many things. Many things. Many things. <laughs> it starts with the floor plan. Three concepts that actually share just one kitchen. Well, nobody's supposed to know that. <gasps> So technically, it's two restaurants and a bar from the guest perspective. In order to have a successful business, you need volume. So I designed something that I felt people needed, living here for so long and being married and then without kids, married with dog, married with kids, with the stroller, without the stroller, and understanding that you need a little bit of everything. Push your dough on top and kind of get your fingers get in the divots. divots in. Executive chef Katerina Petanito gave me a lesson on the art of making three cheese ravioli. Oh wow, I'm getting the hang of this. Yeah, that looks great. And offered her take on the company line. I would say she's probably one of the greatest people I've worked for. She's very passionate about making an environment that's safe and encouraging for everyone to be in. Petanito says the kitchen is built on efficiency. We do all like the right things. We're recycling, we're composting, we're using sustainable products. We're working with local farms and agriculture to make sure that we're bringing in as local ingredients and seasonal, like hyper seasonal ingredients. And Silverman threads her intention through everything, like an all women wine program and executive team. We're trying to change the game. We're trying to really create a place where people feel welcome. Everyone feels welcome. She got her start in San Diego in Northern California with a degree in hospitality management, later transferring to D.C. with her Navy husband, where she landed in the view of Chef Jose Andres. Jose is an amazing leader, but he's also an amazing team member. So he knows how to build a team. He knows how to look at not only food, but look at beverages, look at design, look at all of the things and figure out how to make it better. And that's something that not many people do. She would become chief operating officer of his Think Food Group and over 10 years nearly tripled his staff, expanding his local brand into a national empire. It enabled him to take on big problems like world hunger, Silverman is tackling big issues, too, on a smaller scale. We're tackling tipping. I think that how tipping started is not great. I think that it leads, unfortunately, to a lot of unhealthy cultures and work environments. So we do a service charge instead. We pay people a higher hourly rate. And paying people what they're worth fosters creativity. As we saw with pastry chef and ice cream queen, Rochelle Cooper. And ice cream, I view it as the preservation method. I don't have as many methods of preserving as the culinary team, I would say. We have a lot of fun with it. The team gets creative and comes up with great flavors. Like the dough ball trouble. Oh my gosh. The diet goes out the window here. Experimentation is the spirit of the wells, where gin is front and center. Ooh, okay. You got me at the ice cube. <laughs> well, it's really a good cocktail is about the ice. And then we just add a bunch of fresh citrus and botanicals and herbs and spices to bring out the flavor of the gin. Wow. When are you open? <laughs> <laughs> Running these three concepts is a labor of love Silverman doesn't shy away from. You know, I can't change certain things, but like this is what I can do. So. People can come in, they know that they're gonna have a great time. They feel like they can enjoy someone across the table from them. And that's how I can hopefully put a little bit more joy into people's lives. After the break, topping it off with tacos at one of DC's most popular chains. Chef Victor Elbisu is the culinary mastermind behind Taco Bamba a taqueria chain throughout D.C. and in parts of the South, serving fresh tacos with global flair. The chef told Nancy Chen that it was his mother and grandfather who inspired his culinary journey. In this quiet suburban strip mall, a redefinition of Mexican street food. Can you put anything in a taco? No. <laughs> Victor Albisu is the chef and owner of Taco Bamba and says there's no time to waste in leaving an impression. It's a kind of a, almost like this holy opportunity that you have to give somebody 
just a, a, a wonderful experience with a few bites. Those bites include fried fish squidding tacos, carne asada tortas with a beef frank, egg rolls stuffed with three meats, and even a calamari ceviche with a tropical twist. This coconut milk is amazing. They're inspired in part by Albisu's Peruvian roots, his wife's Lebanese heritage, and the diverse neighborhoods surrounding his 10 restaurants. So that's a chipotle kind of uh, seared uh, portobello mushrooms with heart of palm, a little lime, garlic. It's all kinds of good stuff. Yes, it's very bold. Very bold, that's a good, <laughs> that's a good way. Of, yeah. I like well, it. we do say prepare your mouth here. And there's quite a lot to prepare for. While there are a select few recipes on every menu, the majority are specific to each of Taco Bamba's locations, with hundreds of combinations between them. That's the Taco Bamba. Oh, the Taco Bamba. That's the one that started it all. It has uh, grilled uh, steak, chorizo, chicharrones, cheese, pickled onions, grilled guacamole on it. Grilled guacamole? Yeah. I didn't know you could grill guacamole. Yeah, you just slather it on the grill. I'm just kidding. <laughs> you grill the avocado. Okay. <laughs> I get everybody on that. I'm just, I've been doing that for 10 years. That's when Albisu created the first Taco Bamba, an unexpected detour for a chef who had trained at Le Cordon Bleu, worked at a Parisian Michelin three-star restaurant, and started his own, Del Campo, an acclaimed fine dining experience in D.C. that became an Obama favorite. Instead, he opened a standing-only strip mall taqueria in Falls Church, Virginia. This is the original location. Yes, the OG. When you opened this place, I heard you didn't even want to attach your name to it. Yeah, at the time, it was, um, this was not the level, I guess, in my mind that I wanted to be known for. And you chose this location because? It's right next to my mother's uh, bodega, Plaza Latina, her Latin market. Turns out, Taco Bamba wasn't entirely happenstance. The taqueria just steps from his mother's shop. Albisu started working in the family business at a young age, even making Cuban sandwiches for customers when he was 10. He called it Victor's Deli. I grew up stocking shelves, uh, cutting meat, putting prices on, all that kind of thing. How did that shape you? Well, I got to experience all of this and multicultural food, which uh, kind of changed my life. You know, I didn't realize it at the time. It was kind of a burden at the time, uh, but I... It became, it became kind of really who I am. It took a while to figure out his culinary identity. Albisu, whose parents immigrated from Peru and Cuba, studied international relations and briefly worked for a government agency before suddenly dropping out to study cooking. He says he first learned the skill from his grandfather. My grandfather um, was an amazing cook, a natural cook. He had a little um, a bakery in Cuba, he knew all about food. Right around the time I was going into college, my grandfather passed away and I cooked early on like it was a vendetta. Yeah, like my, I miss my grandfather and um, he never got to see me cook. So it was kind of this empty void that I kept cooking for. That carried me for a long time until I had to put that to bed and stop seeing my reflection in the plate and start being in service of all those around me. That sentiment propels him today and family continues to be front and center. His mom, Rosa Sosinski, still runs her shop now, where Albisu commands a rather prominent position. I gotta ask you this though. I look over here yeah. on your window and you have Jesus <laughs> and Victor. Those are the two people that are so important in my life. <laughs> Susinski's support, unwavering, even when Albisu first came to her with the idea of opening a taco shop. But you had some questions about the taqueria. Ha! Just because we, I, I mean, I never made a taco in my house. <laughs> <laughs> the first day they opened, you went over there and you had one of those tacos. What did you think? Ha! I said, here we go. This is delicious, man. That was great. It's actually, it was incredible. Her influence and handiwork evident in Taco Bamba today. Susinski's handmade chorizo is used in that signature taco we tried with secrets not even her son knows. When do I get the recipe? You'll get the recipe in my will. <laughs> <laughs> the secret's long been out about Taco Bamba though, including from a plug by none other than Billy Gibbons from ZZ Top while he was performing in town. We've got this joint called 
Taco Bamba. Yeah! I've been to many concerts. I don't know how many times I've heard tacos shouted out by someone. <laughs> and then people are like excited about it. Yeah, it's funny. What did you think when you heard that? It was one of the more uh, surreal kind of experiences, you know, to, to have your uh, one of your childhood heroes like appreciating what you do. The two have stayed in contact, and Gibbons even lobbied for Albisu to open a Nashville location. It worked, along with more shops in North Carolina and Virginia. Albisu has hopes for more. The strip mall taqueria joint, now a gathering place for communities. I used to plate on, on beautiful porcelain plates. Yeah. People used to make fun of me for how much I, I, I garnish and how much I put into it. Every detail. Every detail. And if somebody grabbed it and moved it, you know, and something fell, it would be, it's devastating, you know. It's an ego that chefs have to have in some ways to get started. But, uh, but over time, it can turn on you. Today, Albisu says his dishes show a different image. I can't see my reflection in a paper plate, right? So we're just in service of the food. We're in service of each other. This is not about me or anybody else. It's, it's, it's about how we grow. An evolution for the young boy who ran Victor's Deli, serving his neighborhood once again. For more stories like these and live coverage of breaking news 24-7, stream us right here on CBS News. I'm Jeff Glor. We'll see you next time for another helping of The Dish.